Hello students. Today we are here to learn about the general characters, the ecology, significance and the life cycle of a fungus called a rhizobus. Now before we begin our lecture, let us see the taxonomic position of the rhizobus in the living world. Now the class Zygomycetes is relatively a small group of fungi which belongs to the phylum Zygomycota. Now it comprises of 450 species which are grouped under 70 genera and one of the genera is Rhizopus. If we look at the taxonomic position of the Rhizopus, it belongs to the division Mycota, subdivision is Eumycotina, phylum is Zygomycota, class Zygomycetes, order is Mucorelis, family is Mucoraceae and genus we all know is Rhizopus and one of the species I'm talking here is Stolonifa. Here you can see the picture of the Rhizopus growing over the surface of the agar media in vitro. Going on to the ecology of the Rhizopus species, we find that Rhizopus is a worldwide distributed species. It is found on all type of starchy materials that we encounter. It can exist in soil, in air, a wide variety of natural substrates are colonized by different species of rhizopus. Now this shows that rhizopus has got a tolerance power that it can grow on variety of species that means a variety of carbon and nitrogen source available to them can be exploited. Rhizopus is the most common and best known fungus found growing frequently on the stale bread and therefore the other name of rhizopus is bread mold. It occurs in decaying fruits, vegetables and many food materials such as pickles, jam, jellies, etc. The three factors which are essential for its growth and propagation is warmth, plenty of air and moisture. A luxuriant growth of rhizopus can easily be obtained in the laboratory by placing a piece of bread which has been moistened and exposed to air for a couple of days. At first it appears as a small white patch which further grows and it becomes dark black in color. That means the sporulation has started. Here you can see the picture of a piece of a bread where it is white in color in the early stages whereas it becomes dark black in color with black heads showing that it has started reproducing. Coming on to the general characters of the rhizopus, we find that rhizopus is a saprophytic fungus. It can grow on a variety of substrates starting from the mature fruits, vegetables, jellies, syrups, leather, bread, tobacco, peanut, anything. So anything which has got organic matter is a substrate for the rhizopus. They are multicellular. The mycelium of rhizopus during vegetative phase is white fluffy mass and it is an entangled mass of the hyphae. The hyphae constitute the mycelium which is cenocytic and aseptate. That means within the hyphae they do not have any partitioning. It is a complete cenocytic hyphae. During the vegetative phase the mycelium consists of only two types of hyphae. One is called the stolone hyphae and the other one is known as rhizoidal hyphae. Here you can see the picture of the stolone hyphae which is growing over the substrate and these are the rhizoidal hyphae which are moving towards the substratum that is they penetrate inside the substrate in order to get the nourishment from the substrate. When the reproductive phase sets in, in addition to the stolone hyphae and the rhizoidal hyphae, they have third set of hyphae which is known as sporangiophores. Now these sporangiophores arise in tufts in the air from the stolone opposite the rhizoidal hyphae and they are negative geotropic and unbranched. That means just opposite to the rhizoidal hyphae, we can see the growth of the sporangiophores. The two phases of rhizopus encountered in their life cycle is somatic phase and reproductive phase. So let us first learn about the somatic phase and the structures that are associated with the somatic phase. We begin with the first structure and that is the foremost important structure for the fungus is the thallus. Now when we talk about the thallus, it consists of numerous slender, 
freely branched filaments, which is known as hyphae. The hyphae are tangled and they form a white fluffy mass and this is the thallus of the fungus. Basically, it is known as mycelium. Now, this white cottony mass during the vegetative phase changes its color and becomes black in color or deep brown in color as there is development of numerous spores during the reproductive phase. The blackish appearance hence gets its popular name and therefore the rhizopus is also known as a black mold. During the early period of growth, all hyphae look alike. We cannot distinguish which one is the vegetative hyphae, which one is the reproductive hyphae. But as it develops, we have three different types of hyphae known in the case of rhizopus. These three kinds of hyphae are as follows. Number one is stolone. Now in the case of stolone, we call them aerial hyphae because they are always above the substratum. They grow horizontally over the surface of the substratum. They are stout, they are less branched and each stolone hyphae arise from the point of contact of the mycelium and substratum. The second type of hyphae is known as holdfast or the other way we call it rhizoidal hyphae. Now this is a cluster of brown slender branched rooting hyphae which arise from the lower surface of the apparent node of each stolone and penetrate the starchy substance of the substratum. So they secrete certain enzymes which help in the digestion of the material which is present in the substratum. So their role is to anchor the substratum as well as absorb water and nourishment from the substratum. The, during the vegetative phase, we find these two types, that is the stolone and the holdfast. The third type of hyphae that we come across in rhizopus is sporangiophores. Now sporangiophores, they start growing into the air. They are reproductive in function and they bear sporangia singly and terminally. That is at the tip of each sporangiophore, we find a single sporangium. These negatively geotropic unbranched special hyphae are known as sporangiophores. So here you can see the picture of three different types of hyphae found in rhizopus. This one is the stolone hyphae. These are the rhizoidal hyphae penetrating deep inside the substrate. And these are the sporangiophore. And at the tip of the sporangiophore, here you can see a terminal sporangia is present which bear the spores for the reproduction. And this is the picture of the rhizopus growing over the surface of a stale bread, greenish in color or sometimes blackish in color. If we move on to the structure of the thallus, we find that each hyphae has got an hyphal wall which is made of a substance called chitin. Now this chitin has got hydrogen, carbon, and in addition, it also contains nitrogen. The chitinous wall of rhizopus is permeable to water as well as the other substances that are present in the solution form. The young hyphal tips are full of dense protoplasm and embedded in the cytoplasm are numerous ribosomes. Endoplasmic reticulum is also present. The mitochondria with double membrane is also found in the cytoplasm. So the prominent granules that are present are the ribosomes and also there is presence of endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria and the wall is having the chitin which is a specialized component found in the fungus. Coming on to the nutrition of the rhizopus. Now rhizopus do not bear chlorophyll molecule. That means they are heterotrophs. They cannot synthesize their own food and therefore they have to depend on some other organic substrate. It is considered to be a saprophytic organism because it feeds on dead decaying matter such as soil or any decaying matter of plant and animal origin. It is also considered to be parasitic because sometimes it is found to be growing on the living organic matter as well. And therefore, during that time, they secrete certain digestive juices that contain enzymes which act directly on the food and then it is absorbed by the mold. The mold spreads over the surface of the substrate, sending its hyphae inward to absorb the nutrition. The sugar and the starch are favored by the mold. 
So while growing on the bread, the mold takes up the nutrition from the carbohydrate component that is present in the bread. Due to presence of the hyphae, the rhizopus stores the food. First it takes the food from the substratum and then it can store the food in the form of glycogen. Coming on to the second phase of the rhizopus which is known as the reproductive phase. Now in the reproductive phase we talk about the modes of reproduction exhibited by rhizopus. Rhizopus reproduces by both methods that is asexual and sexual. Talking about the asexual mode of reproduction we say that it reproduces by vegetative method or by a method known as sporulation. Now vegetative method takes into account the method known as fragmentation. Now in the case of fragmentation what happens is one of the aerial mycelium cuts off accidentally from a tuff of hyphae and then on getting a suitable substrate it starts growing and matures into a mother mycelium because it can exhibit the apical growth. The second type of asexual reproduction is formation of chlamydospore. Now when we talk about chlamydospore, we have to understand what exactly is a chlamydospore. The other name of chlamydospore is a resting spore. This is formed during unfavorable conditions when there is a shortage of water. Now during this time, the protoplasmic content of the hyphae accumulate at certain point and they lose water the intervening parts they remain empty. Each localized protoplasmic accumulation now secretes a thick wall around itself and it becomes a chlamydospore. The chlamydospore in rhizopus are thus intercalary that means we have presence of two chlamydospore and in between the two chlamydospore we have the presence of the vegetative hyphae which can be seen very well in this picture. So this intercalary Chlamydospore are resistant to desiccation and they are in fact the resting cells of the rhizopus. As the substratum on which the fungus grows dries out, the mycelium perishes but the chlamydospores survive because they have developed a thick wall around themselves. On return of the favorable condition, the suitable for the vegetative growth, the perinating chlamydospore starts germinating they produce new mycelium and therefore chlamydospore are the structures which enable the fungus to survive the unfavorable conditions such as short, uh, shortage of water and the chlamydospores now start germinating and form the mother mycelium. So here you can see the picture of how the intercalary chlamydospore are formed inside the hyphae which are uh, or which remain or survive during unfavorable condition when the vegetative mycelium has dried out and this chlamydospore on formation of germ tube develops into a mature mother mycelium. Coming on to the method of sporulation which is again an asexual method of reproduction, it takes place by formation of spores inside the sporangium. A sickle sporangia develops at the tip of the long erect sporangia fore and a dome-shaped columella is present inside the sporangium. The protoplast of the columella is in continuation that of sporangiospore. The space between the columella and the wall of sporangium is known as the spore sac. It remains filled with the spores. Each spore is ovoid, non-motile, unicellular and multinucleate structure. There is no flagella on the spores. The spores come out when the sporangia burst open and finally they are dispersed with the help of the wind and after getting a suitable substrate they start germinating forming new mycelium. Here you can see the picture of how the sporangia 4 bears a single sporangia, the columella which is present inside, the sac or the spore sac is filled with the spores and the spores when mature they sporangium burst out, the spores are coming out and then they are dispersed with the help of the wind. Coming on to the sexual reproduction in rhizopus which is again very important. Sexual reproduction in rhizopus is also referred to as the gametangial copulation because here we talk about the mixing of the two different types of gametangia. So when the hyphae from opposite strains grow close together, they swell up. 
Here you can see the picture of the rhizopus, just a diagrammatic sketch where we find that two types of rhizopus strains are growing, one of them designated as a plus strain and the other one designated as the minor strain. Now these two strains come close to each other and hyphae from both the strains, they come in contact with the each other. The nuclei and the cytoplasm from both hyphae move into these swellings and now they are known as progametangia. A transverse septum known as gametangial septum appears on each progametangia near its tip. So here you can see the septation taking place and it cuts off the terminal cell from the gametangia from the proximal part. So therefore we have a proximal part which is known as suspensor. Here you can see the suspensor and these are the gametes or the gametangia that have developed from a plus strain as well as from the negative strain. So these two now come close to each other. The suspensor contains the vacuolate cytoplasm with few nuclei and the fusing gametangia are multinucleated and they are similar in every re respect but they are genetically distinct. When the gametangia are mature, the walls of the gametangia dissolve and a number of fertilization take place and therefore we have formation of the diploid zygote nuclei. The combined protoplast containing a number of diploid nuclei is now known as zygospore. The young zygospore increases in size, secretes a thick multilayered wall around it and therefore it forms a zygosporangium. So here you can see the picture of a zygosporangium which is having a single zygospore. The outermost layer is thick, warty. The single zygospore develops within the zygosporangium. So if I move to this picture again, we can see the formation of the zygospore which is having a nucleus which is 2N in uh, form or diploid. Now after the formation of zygospore, the mature suspensor withers or it is lost and the zygosporangia contains the zygospore, it is set free. It enters a period of rest which may extend over several months and when the conditions are suitable, the zygospore germinates and undergoes the process of meiosis. As a result, the diploid nucleus is now converted into a haploid nucleus. A hypha grows out of the zygospore and produces a sporangia at the tip. The sporangia opens and releases many haploid spores which now grow into new individuals. In this way, the diploid nucleus is converted to the haploid spores and the spores germinate finally giving rise to the mother mycelium. So if we study the life cycle of the rhizopus, we find that it has got a sexual reproductive phase in which we find that the plus and the minus strains, that is the mycelium of two different rhizopus or strains coming together, they come in close contact with each other, the wall dissolves after the formation of a septum, so they have formation of gametangia, Ultimately, this leads to the formation of the zygospore. So here you can see the picture of the zygospore, which now develops a thick wall around it. That means a zygosporangium is formed, enclosing the zygospore. The nuclei inside the zygospore is diploid. This diploid nuclei undergoes meiosis. Formation of the germ tube takes place from the zygospores, and therefore we have the spores, which now possess the haploid nuclei. These spores now enter the asexual mode of reproduction where they germinate on getting a suitable substratum on favorable conditions, they develop into the haploid mycelium, which is again xenocytic and aseptate. So in the life cycle of rhizopus, we find the haploid as well as diploid phases of the nuclei. Now we should also understand the significance of the rhizopus. Why are we so bothered about the rhizopus? What happens whether we have a bad or a good effect of the rhizopus? So let us study the significance of the rhizopus and we find that rhizopus stolonifer has some importance to the environment because they play a key role as saprophytic microorganism and therefore they participate in the carbon cycle of the environment because they are decomposers in the soil, they decompose many organic matter. 
Rhizopus stolonifer and other species of rhizopus also produce ethyl alcohol which is most important fermentative product. Rhizopus stolonifer is also used commercially to manufacture fumaric acid and lactic acid of high purity. Scientists have also found that rhizopus stolonifer can be used in medication such as birth control pills. Some species of rhizopus are also used in the food industry. For example, in Indonesia, the soya bean are fermented with the help of species of the rhizopus for the preparation of a delicious food called tem. Therefore, rhizopus has got a very important role in the preparation of a food. On the other hand, we find that a rhizopus is responsible for the economic loss in the food industry because they are growing in the fruits, vegetables and any starchy material that is there in the food industry. And therefore, they are responsible for the heavy loss of the food industry. They excrete certain extracellular enzymes and they take up the nutrient which is dissolved in the substrate where they are residing. And therefore, the rotting of most of the fruits and the vegetable takes place with the species of rhizopus. Rhizopus is also an opportunistic agent of diseases. That means they do not cause any infection in human. However, in those persons where we find the immunity is weakened or suppressed, they result because they result in a disease called zygomycosis. Now this is the name coming on because we call it a rhizopus and therefore the disease referred to here is called zygomycosis. There are many species of rhizopus which is responsible for this disease. Finally, we can conclude that the rhizopus is the first microbe to grow on the surface of the stale bread or any other starchy food material that is available in our house or in food industry. It is saprophytic as it does not possess any chlorophyll. Hence, it grows very fast on the surface, inserting its rhizoidal hyphae inside the substrate. It secretes many enzymes to degrade the sugar present in the substrate. Since it can form chlamydospores in addition to the sporangiospores, it can overcome many unfavorable conditions and can survive for a very long period. The three factors essential for its growth are warmth, plenty of air, and moisture. If black bread mold is spotted on any type of bread in our house, or if a mold is found on soft fruits, it is important to discard the food as soon as possible and avoid the contact with such type of organism as it may lead to the pathogenesis of zygomycosis. That is all. Thank you.